Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for joining us today in our cardiovascular grand round. Welcome, Dr. Estep, and thank you for joining us today. And thank you, Ms. Vanessa Smith. My name is Lorena Telles. I work at the Cardio Infantile Foundation, and it's my pleasure to introduce to you to our moderators for this event. Dr. Maria Juliana Rodriguez, Chief of Cardiac Failure, Dr. Monica Lopez, Cardiologist of the Cardiac Failure Unit, and Dr. Carlos Santa Cruz, Cardiac Anesthesiologist. Welcome and thank you for moderating this event. Buenas tardes y muchas gracias a todos por su asistencia. Mi nombre es María Juliana Rodríguez. Estaré junto con la doctora Mónica López y el doctor Carlos Santa Cruz compartiendo la moderación de esta actividad. Nuevamente les recordamos que al conectarse eh, a esta conferencia autorizan el tratamiento de sus datos personales, los cuales serán tratados de acuerdo a la ley 1581 de 2012 y nuestra política de datos personales, las, la cual pueden ustedes consultar en www.cardioinfantil.org. De igual forma, les informamos que esta conferencia está siendo grabada. El chat de preguntas se encuentra habilitado en la barra de participantes. Les agradecemos dejar allí todas sus inquietudes, las cuales resolveremos al final de la sesión. Y un agradecimiento especial a Abbott por vincularse como patrocinador exclusivo de esta actividad. Buenas tardes. Hoy tenemos el honor de contar con la participación como expositor del doctor Jerry Step con la conferencia Contemporary Clinical Evaluation for Eligibility of Heart Failure Patients Going for LVAD versus Heart Transplant. He earned his medical degree from Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas, after completing his residency in internal medicine at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center, Dallas. He completed cardiology, echocardiography, and uh, heart failure fellowship at Baylor College of Medicine at the Methodist and Texas Heart Institute. He also has completed a physician leadership course at the University of Texas Health Science Center in Dallas. And Dr. Estep is the section head of heart failure and heart transplantation and the medical director of the Cleveland Clinic Foundation. He holds a board certification in advanced heart failure and transplant and cardiovascular disease. Welcome, Dr. Jerry. You may start. Thank you, Monica and Maria I, and, and Hector. I appreciate the opportunity and I hope my screen's coming in clearly and everyone hears me um, clearly. Delighted to share with you um, really an update regarding what it what an advanced heart failure workup is to guide one with regard to decision making on LVAD therapy, and I, I will talk some about tran heart transplant, but the goal here in my mind is to focus in on, on durable VAD therapy, and in particular defining uh, what qualifies or constitutes a high-risk profile. Now, we use multiple domains to understand disease severity and to understand patients' goals quality of life expectations. We pursue shared decision making, which I'll highlight towards the end. But listed here, importantly, it's having an understanding of the underlying, not only advanced directives, but hemodynamic profile, imaging surrogates of high risk. Um, at times we look into modeling blood work to reflect severity and prognosis. And of course the important clinical factors, including the exam, functional capacity, hospitalization burden, and frailty. Now, when one looking and incorporating those, that information fills the likelihood of progression and dying more than 50% over the next several months to a year, we say the patient has end-stage heart failure. And here in the United States, heart transplantation has been the gold standard, but the unfortunate reality, even in more con recent years, we're still limited by donor availability. And here um, highlights around 3,500 transplants in 2019. And I can tell you it remains between 3,500 and 3,800 in terms of heart transplants and the number of patients in need of a end organ interventions higher than this. Not gonna share a lot of institutional information, but we're very 
um, proud of our survival results. We're certainly dominant in the Northeast and are a top three transplant LVAD program, um, best in, in quality and our projected one year survivals 97.3% and three year survival after transplant 88.4%. This is important because we share these projections with our patient and one's gonna wanna do the same regarding LVAD therapy. I am going to refer to the Intermax profile, and as uh, many may be familiar with, it captures severity of illness, those that are in overt refractory cardiogenic shock or Intermax 1, anotrope, uh, anotrope uh, uh, support being used in a stable patient would qualify as, as Intermax 3, and those that are declining despite anotrope use or Intermax 2. Ambulatory patients but are sufficiently ill are in this Intermax 4 through 7 category. Rest breathlessness we equate to Intermax 4. And what I would highlight that the decision making related to projections, benefits versus risk, in those that are ambulatory but sufficiently ill goes beyond survival alone. The hallmark randomized control trial really related to the use of ads in those that were among the sickest. And so I'll, I'll highlight some observational data related to the benefits and risks of VAD in the less sick but sufficiently sick patient population. So Hector gave me clear instructions about three cases, and I'm going to present the first case. And we this was easy for me to make because we present all our cases to our medical review board in this fashion. Um, we have a, a, the presentation put forth on PowerPoint to guide discussion. So 68-year-old who has um, underlying non-ischemic disease. Um, it's been progressive over the years, complicated by ventricular tachycardia. He does have some comorbidities related to diabetes. Um, and when I, origi uh, when I originally met him, we had categorized him as stage C. But due to progression, in December of 2020, he was hospitalized with a low cardiac, cardiac output state and put on an onotrope. And this has been complicated in the context of the rhythm burden um, and need for amiodarone or antirhythmic use. We always want to understand any incidental findings that may project to risk. He had a benign, uh, what proved to be a benign lung nodule. In the context of transplant, we understand sternotomy burden, previous surgeries, and then blood typing in the context of potential uh, waiting times. Here's a list of his medicines. We never define or declare someone as end stage unless they have refractory symptoms despite optimal guideline medical therapy. And as you all know, there are now four pillars, beta blockers, ACE, ARB, or ARNI, MRA. And what I would put in here, not listed here, is SGL2. And so he has, uh, has been on um, two of those four, but limited because of intolerance which is uh, really a red flag in and of itself. His end organ function um, is serum creatinine is 1.32. He has normal liver function, um, no protein in his urine despite a creatinine of 1.3. His GFR is 54. So more stage two uh, renal disease. He has an underlying paced rhythm. Um, thankfully, um, post ablation, his rhythm burden has been uh, not reoccurring. And uh, anybody on CRT pacing, we like to ensure the greatest degree of biventricular pacing and his was was excellent at 97%. Here's his plain film, not a lot of congestion. We look at CAT scans to understand cal calcification burden for our surgeons and if they had a prior stenotomy proximity uh, to reentry. Um, and here is just comments related to a benign lung mass. And we review these CTs in real time. Importantly, echocardiography is used not only to confirm overt remodeling, look at LV size, and with regards to LVAD consideration, we go through a, a checklist to look for high-risk features. One of the most important points is predicting RV failure, and I'll be commenting on that, but I'm showing you as four chamber uh, views. Uh, really severely depressed LV, RV is dilated in at least moderately uh, compromised. There was no significant um, left-sided valvular lesions. He does have a 
component of, uh, of tricuspid regurge. And here's his formal report. His um, end diastolic dimensions 5.5. We look at volume metrics, TF 21% and the moderate TR. Um, we wanted to ensure we weren't missing anything, no evidence of uh, uh, any active inflammation to, to suggest sarcoid. Um, and he has not had any uh, ischemic disease or known coronary artery disease. Here are his hemodynamics historically and more contemporary. And I would highlight his wedge is 25. His mean pulmonary pressure is 35. His transpulmonary gradient is 11. Um, he has a cardiac index both by thermo and FIC, that's 1.7, and a right atrial pressure, that's 9. That particular day, his mean blood pressure was 80 with a systemic vascular resistance of around 1,600. We always, for those that are ambulatory, look at exercise capacity, exercise metabolic testing. His peak VO2 was 16.5. Good um, effort with an RER of 1.16, and his VE VCO2 slope was 33. Um, that had been historically. When we repeated it, it came down to under 12, despite his current use of meds and his VEVCO2 was 41. So certainly compromised functional capacity, only 44% of predicted peak VO2. So he had had uh, both a high grade of symptom burden and objective testing to suggest higher grade New York heart class. We, we look at carotids and, and, and ultrasound of the abdomen to screen for any incidental findings related to organ issues or risk, nothing here to report. We look at full spirometry and, uh, and, and uh, he had, you know, the presence of reduced lung diffusion capacity, um, but his FEV1 um, measure was 3.18. And in the context of transplant to understand risk related to rejection, we look at calculated PRAs. I'm not going to go through the full breadth of his uh, psychosocial, nutrition, pharmacy, financial, but we do this in order at every meeting and everyone weighs in. So this gentleman's 68, non-ischemic, New York Art class 3B4, progressive remodeling, underlying VT, more recently quiescent. I didn't mention his progression related to some anorexia and weight loss categorizes Intermax 4. So the question is, is how best to proceed? And so the aim here is for, for this to be interactive. And before I transition in on, um, you know, what we decided and put forth some comments in terms of rationale and outcome data, I'd be very interested in what you guys would offer for a patient like this in Colombia. I think Probably I go first or Dr. Monica want to go first. Go ahead. OK, so probably in Colombia with this um, age would proceed with transplant heart. Probably, I mean, first we go with heart transplant and then because the right ventricle looks good, it would be a candidate to for um, an LBAT if everything is OK with the immunologic things. Sounds good. Any other comments from anyone else? Just that in our protocol, the between 65 and 70 years of age, we leave them with a with an amplified uh, criteria. Usually we cut at 65, but between 65 and 70, we uh, we have to make some other evaluations like mental age and all that kind of social. Sure, sure. So I can, does anybody else want to make a comment before I proceed? No, I think you can proceed. Okay, excellent. So, so, you know, we, we don't have necessarily an age cutoff for transplant. Um, certainly above 80 would be preclusive, but we look at physiologic age. We have a new heart transplant allocation system in the United States, which was rolled out October 18th, 2018. And heart transplants are going to those that are the most severely ill, namely status one through three. And so we're, we're very aggressive in those we want to get to transplant, but if they have to have an underlying hemodynamic profile 
um, that supports use of either inotropes or devices, like based on index less than 2.2, high wedge, systolic blood pressure under 90. So for these ambulatory patients that are progressing, and our concern here was his weight loss, anorexia, starting to become, I didn't mention it, but de deconditioned. And so putting him on the transplant list, we certainly wanted to do, but knowing that he would wait for some time, we decided to use an LVAD to help stabilize you know, he had had that recent hospitalization with inotrope need and is having progressive symptoms and signs. And so here is the, um, the up-to-date national coverage determination for those that uh, receive um, Medicare and, and it's appropriate to use a VAD and momentum really changed the, 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 the landscape for us. And we're using device for extended support, independent of labeling as a bridge to transplant or DT. But for those that have New York Heart Class 4, he had, EF under 25%, he had. Um, and even though he's not onotrope dependent, he had low index and high filling pressures and was, and this was despite being on optimal medical management. And so, you know, these criteria guided the excellent outcome seen in the Momentum HeartMate 3 trial and now, now have been incorporated in terms of a criteria to use LVAD um, in the United States. And, you know, the HeartMate 3 has become our LVAD of choice. We're doing now about 100 LVADs per year, and it's the most forgiving pump based on its design. Um, I will ask, and Hector had mentioned it, are you guys, you guys do offer VAD or you're starting up VAD, uh, a VAD program? Starting. We are going to start. Okay, excellent, excellent. And, and this device compared to the other devices, are, is very nice in that the pathway in terms of the red blood cell being able to course you know, around the rotor um, is the most forgiving, it's the largest. The pump right will ramp down and up and it will do so um, to, to, to wash out the pump. And there is this artificial uh, pulse. And when we look at not only the momentum trial, but more real world outcomes derived from our registry, you know, survival at two years, highlighted in this Kaplan-Meier curve with a HeartMate 3, is at 84%. And that's certainly the best we've seen, you know, in, in, in large part due to the technological advances. And when you look at transplant in the United States, on average, two-year survival of 82% in select patients, this is right, right it's, 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 it's matching contemporary transplant outcomes. So this is very um, reassuring to see and and you know we too have um, FDA approved pumps including the HeartMate 2. The HeartMate 2 is a historic pump. We put all of them in the in the museum. They're not being used anymore because there's no reason to use it when you have the HeartMate 3. HVAD for select patients based on anatomic concerns had been a historical consideration but that's no longer the case. Um, our, our profile is that of the HeartMate 3. And the reason is, is because it's association with good outcome. That's been proven institutionally at our at the Cleveland Clinic. And when we look at databases, and this is again, um, the Intermax 2019 annual report um, published in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery and in JHLT. And what you can appreciate in the purple Kaplan-Meier curve with use of the HeartMate 3 compared to the HVAD or HeartMate 2, the greatest freedom from GI bleed, stroke, major infection, and right heart failure. And so we had no qualms about placing a HeartMate 3 in this patient as a bridge to transplant to keep him stable. We had equipoise to do so in the context of his Intermax 4 profile, and we wouldn't want him to end up in VT storm, crashing and burning, and it would just be a higher risk transplant. And so he is now three months out, no complication, and he's listed status uh, four. Do you have any questions for me related to case one? I have two more cases to present. Yes, I have a question, doctor. You you told us that the first patient was an Intermax 4, and we can, I mean, we could see the hemodynamics profile, and for sure he is going to need some um, advanced therapy immediately. But for example, if, if we look at the data, we can see that there is not cost effective when you are in Intermax 4 to decide uh, to put um, a patient 
with an LBAT as um, as a bridge to her transplant. Do you have a comment on that? Yeah. So so cost of effectiveness is a uh, a loaded term that certainly one would want to look at the full spectrum of of costs and resource use um, and ultimately what's most important is you know patient years added and so uh, uh, there hasn't been in the contemporary new transplant allocation in the united states a good cost effectiveness examination so the jury's still out in that regard some of the cost effectiveness with VAD therapy in general is related to the older technology where adverse events and hospitalization burdens were very very high and its cost effectiveness was was questioned um you know the the project there's been no randomized control trial with watchful waiting on medicines versus early listing versus bad use in an intermax 4 patient the uh, observations really stem from registry like revival which was previously revive it here in the united states roadmap which was an observational trial i had the privilege to lead and metamax which i'm going to show you some of the data some of the contemporary observations are that the trajectory for an individual patient can be poor when they're intermax 4 with all the caveats of classifying intermax 4. in my mind um you know if someone's in and out with low output symptoms low index they could be intermax 3 it's a decision to use an inotrope now when you look at rematch inotrope use was really dependent upon tissue hypoperfusion and you put the balloon you put the inotrope on they got better than you did it twice and there is a lot of heterogeneity and inotrope decision making and dependency, if you will. And so for this particular patient, we weren't considering for an individual patient cost effectiveness. That's a that's a that needs to be deemed at the system level or at the national level. We are simply trying to halt the progression of his disease and get him to transplant in the best shape. One would have considered direct transplant. And, 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 you know, our transplant numbers, um, we're doing about 60 plus per year. And if his blood pressure were lower and we felt his, you know, his, his conditioning was good, we'd support him with the balloon pump. I place axillary balloon pumps in the left axillary artery and bridge patients directly. We will do that do nine that. times, 10 times out of 10 if, if patients meet criteria. And so this is so, so to individualize it can be challenging, but I, I appreciate your, um, your comments and so there there's there's a lot in your comments and and I, I very much appreciate it and what i plan to show you after case two or three is some of the um, observations related to risk stratification um, in these ambulatory patients so so uh, continue to be attentive to, to, to what i'm going to show you thank you doctor so let's do this it's 225 and i'm a stickler for time i'm going to proceed with case two so 71 year old um, with female, non ischemic, multiple hospitalizations, whom I had the privilege of seeing dating back to 2019. Um, I categorized her as New York Heart Class 4, and she was admitted then. She is a blood type O. She has comorbidities as listed here albeit no sternotomy, some diabetes, um, some sleep apnea and hypothyroidism. So I had uh, up titrated her core egg, which is the best beta blocker to 25 twice a day. She was intolerant to ACE, ARB and Arnie. This is pre SG2 era, but I did have her on some hydralazine and Isodil. She had some, some kidney issues, which I'll highlight. And she was an MR, on a higher dose MRA being used for diuretic uh, purposes as well, and terosamide. So let me show you her database, her NT pro BMP. Like how often are you guys seeing more than 70,000 for NT pro BMP, right? And, and our upper limit of normal is 125. So very high um, serum creatinine running between 2.3 to 2.5, hyponatremia, her GFR, um, Caucasian female, all under 25, um, no protein in her urine, an anemia, chronic disease with her heart failure and renal insufficiency. She had had some transient transaminitis here, mildly elevated, but total bilirubin and albumin looked good. 
um, some work to be done perhaps on her thyroid. We, I'm not going to get into the details. We always want to make sure we're not missing anything in terms of etiology. She does not have amyloid heart disease. She has a sinus rhythm. We always look on what we can work on, right? Thinking of resynchronization, mitral regurg, and mitral valve clip. She had nothing to really work on in that regard, and there is her plain film. So let's look at her echo. Peristonal long EF is significantly depressed. End diastolic is 5.6 for a female that is uh, dilated. No significant hypertrophy. Here's her four chamber. RV, there is some depression, maybe mild dilatation, but not, not overt. She has some mitral regurgitation. My colleagues quantitated in NEA for 21%, moderate MR. I didn't show you her PR, but moderate PR some stigmata by echo of pulmonary hypertension and high filling pressures, no AI. So here is her hemodynamic profile. Wedge was 30, all post capillary pulmonary hypertension with a mean pulmonary pressure of 37, TBG 7, PBR 1. Actually thermo and in, 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 uh, FIC estimates of index, not that bad, not that bad, right? 2.4 with a right atrial pressure of 18. And her SVR was 1100, upper limits and normal. Mean blood pressure that day was a little high, but I can tell you she was normal tensive historically. I didn't mention she has a right kidney that's atrophic to the left, which had been an historical observation, but her, her parenchymal uh, echogenicity on the left was normal. So 71 high hospitalization burden, um, Intermax 4 or 5, chronic renal failure. I didn't go over the details of her diabetes, but less than 6. What would this lady have in Colombia? What do you guys suggest? I'm interested in your feedback. Dr. Alopez, you go ahead first. No, no, you go ahead. <laughs> okay. Well, here in Colombia, it's a difficult decision because uh, because of the age, you know, we we go for transplant till 70, you know, and as Dr. Monica mentioned before, we have a special uh, test between 65 and 70 years old. And in Colombia, we are just starting um, this. I mean, this, this is going to be the second pro the program, the third program to start uh, uh, the album implants. But in the first program, they just consider until the age of 70 to implant the elbat. So for us, probably the first option is to, to palliative cardiovascular um, services. And the second, if, if this can be um, authorized because of the, self, uh, the health insurances, it could be for an elbat as a destination therapy. Also, we have problems with bridge to transplant LVADs. They're not very um, authorized by by the by the health insurances. Got it. Any questions for me before I tell you the decision we took and the rationale? Yeah, yeah, I have a question. Mm, from from the point of view of the uh, geriatric service, did you um, did um, any kind of examination about the functional status and everything with the with these comorbidities, diabetes, uh, uh, renal dysfunction? Yeah, so it's a great question for us. If you have a hemoglobin A1C under seven and no diabetic end organ damage, um, that's a uh, an acceptable profile for either transplant or VAD. The real issue here is her renal insufficiency, and I'm and you know I'm going to highlight some risk factors for for transplant. Um, but renal insufficiency in and of itself is a risk factor for LVAD renal dialysis or renal replacement therapy requiring. And so we do a lot of work to better understand cardiorenal syndrome. And when I see elevated central venous pressure, and we know that's after load for the kidney. You couple that with compromised arterial filling, a surrogate would be compromised cardiac index. You have a cardiorenal syndrome environment, and 
We'll do tailored therapy in our heart failure unit. We'll replace a swan, try to achieve normal filling pressure and better cardiac index and see how the kidneys respond. For some people where the SVR is high, we'll do nipride and then try to tailor them to oral therapy. For others, maybe it's an inotrope, sometimes intra-aortic and counterpulsation. And so for this, this lady, she was uh, outpatient and a consideration would have been to, to, to optimize. Now, when I showed you her hemodynamics, her cardiac index by our measurements did not look that bad. She has a left kidney that looks good structurally. She doesn't have protein in her urine, but her, her right kidney is diseased. So we had a lot of discussion about that. And, um, and I'm gonna tell you what we did and we'll see how it, how it worked out. But in this scenario, we would um, float a swan, admit to the hospital and try to optimize to see where the kidneys are prior to commitment. When you have a GFR under 30 pre-LVAD, that is a risk factor. So with that, I'll go ahead and, and proceed. And I've asked, you know, what you guys would do. And I think I heard um, she's too old for transplant. Uh, you don't do DTVAD. I heard that palliative type of medicine. Maybe that means try to optimize the meds. And so here's some have, options. We have, we have, excuse me, doctor. We have um, a program of uh, outpatient inotrope infusions. So probably this patient could go to this program and optimize uh, the GDMT as, I mean, as maximum as, as we can. I think, I, yeah, I think that would be a reasonable alternative um, to understand maybe improvement in kidney and maybe to influence commitment to VAD or not. Now we have the luxury of, you know, DT VAD program. And so I'm going to put forth some didactic, if you will, just for the next few slides and then tell you what we did and how she how she's doing. So Eileen Sheese oversees our transplant programs on some excellent work about understanding risk factors associated with the di different phases of death after transplant. Um, and we certainly know, you know, dying during index transplant, the, the risk factors are, are listed here. And a lot of them are intuitive, right? If you're on ECMO, on the vent, high, you know, total bilirubin of older age and, you know, compromised renal function, these patients do the worst after heart transplant. Um, and in terms of the, you know, constant late phase, they're, they're listed. So these are established risk factors. And at our institution, um, you know, we've transplanted patients up to the age of uh, 75, 76, when they don't have a lot of other risk factors. Um, and if they're not as sick, meaning Intermax 1 on ECMO, um, this can be a, a challenge. So, so we, we, we have these as, you know, relative risk factors um, in the current allocation scheme. We are using ECMO, but we try to get them off the vent. We ensure they're optimal in terms of their end organ function and are awake and attentive. So we try to mitigate. Well, if we're gonna go and pick one risk factor, it's in association, it's not in association with a, a number of other high risk factors. So I wanted to share that with you. And here's just a general table in terms of relative and specific. The ones we won't go against for transplant, if you have a persistently high transpulmonary gradient over 15 or PVR over four, that would be a contraindication, active infection, Intermax one or two with end organ failure, we won't take directly to transplant, um, advanced renal or lung disease, active tobacco use or alcohol use um, or, or other illicit drug use. Here are the ones that are relative. I've mentioned age. Cancer is an absolute if it's within five years. We're a little bit more forgiving with prostate cancer localized in renal cell cancer. If, if you know we mandate that or at least two years out and, and they're in remission after a curative surgical procedure. Now going back to, to LVAD and this patient is ambulatory one can argue maybe she should be inpatient and so here is our two observational data sets roadmap um, looked at LVAD use versus medical therapy perspective non-randomized and the two arms weren't um, necessarily of similar severity, but we did a, I had the, uh, the opportunity to lead that effort. This is the two year data, but when we go back and look at the breadth of the data, those that were Intermax one did the best in terms of meeting the study primary endpoint alive and greater than 75 meter, six minute walk distance. 
and they did the best with New York Heart Class and quality of life metrics. But with the HeartMate 2, adverse event burden was still high compared to just using medicine. So it's a trade off. And when we look at Metamax, which is the medical arm of Intermax, um, and we do uh, matching to, to Intermax, those that are categorized as uh, uh, Intermax um, 4 and 5 versus LVAD 4 and 5, those supported by LVADs do letter. Again, not, ra not randomized, but those advanced ambulatory patients are not going to do well. Certainly, if you're needing to use a home infusion of ionotrope, their one-year, two-year survival, survival is going to be um, poor. And, you know, for select patients, destination therapy for us or extended support is growing and accounts for about 70% of all uh, implants. So for this particular patient, we felt that her risk profile was too high for transplant. Um, you know, went back and forth about destination therapy VAD, and uh, we needed to ensure this was aligned with her goals. And I'm going to talk about shared decision making. Um, but this, she's now two years out doing alive and well, and her kidney normalized. Um, and here's her hemodynamic profile on a HeartMate 3 support. We, by protocol, always do a right heart cath around four weeks after an LVAD to optimize. And so with normalization of her heart failure syndrome, um, she achieved improvement in her end organ function, albeit in the setting of that, 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 that right kidney disease, and uh, improvement in her, in, her, in her quality of life and, and I would argue survival, even though I can't say, okay, she, up front, she would have had a survival advantage that proved to be the case. So it's 2.40, we have another 20 minutes. I have one more case and a handful of slides, but before we transition, I'm happy to answer any questions related to that case presentation. Um, Dr. Estep, yes, we have some questions from the audience. So uh, I, will, uh, I will read you two questions. The first is, uh, is the patient one is on full medical treatment after LVAD implantation? And the second one is that if you have some uh, ethical uh, issues with this patient, uh, some, some discussion with the uh, ethical, uh, I don't know, do you have an, an ethical uh, meeting or something uh, for these uh, kind of patients like the, the second one, I think. Yes, so, so, so thank you. So your, your, your first question related to whether the patient was on full medical therapy after LVAD. So it begs the question, what is optimal medical therapy after an LVAD? And so, you know, the all historically, I say historic and I'll define it, patients on an LVAD are on aspirin and Coumadin with an INR goal of two to three to improve hemocompatible, to, to minimize clotting and, and bleeding, right? You, you, you watch the INR closely. We have learned that patients that are on stage C guideline directed medical therapy, ACE, ARB, or Entresto, um, MRA, and digoxin use, that event free survival is better. It's based on observational data. The reason why these meds may be helpful is because they can help um, minimize late or progressive RV failure. And, and there's also the pleiotropic effects. And so we've noticed less GI bleeding and less RV failure when we're being aggressive. On top of that, I would say a current standard is to ensure someone has a mean blood pressure mean between 65 and 85. Hypertension in these patients is associated with clotting, progressive heart failure, and renal failure, to name three. And so when someone asks me what is optimal medical therapy after a VAD, it's anticoagulation, aspirin, um, Coumadin. It's treating high blood pressure. We don't know which medicine proven is the best, but we extrapolate from the stage C optimal medical management and we'll use our biases uh, uh, in Tresto, um, followed by ACE, followed by ARB. Um, and uh, if they have RV failure, we'll certainly uh, incorporate some um, digoxin. There's been some association with less GI bleeding with, uh, with, with digoxin use. So there is no standard that's recommended by society based on randomized control trial. Um, we're doing a, a an institutional randomization. Not ra it's a it is a randomization of RNA versus not. And right now, guided by Abbott, we're doing a landmark Aries trial where we're, we have aspirin placebo versus true aspirin. Um, in addition to Coumadin, it's a large 40 center plus trial. 
um, underway. So we'll be able to answer what is the ideal medical therapy. Um, there's been preliminary data suggests Coumadin alone for heart may 3 patients will suffice, but that's preliminary right now. The standard is a baby aspirin and an INR 2 to 3. So that's the answer to question one, and the answer is simple. There is no standard other than what I mentioned, but that's my bias. Regarding the ethics, you know, core to our group mandated, mandated by our joint commission, which oversees our, all the institutional programs is social work uh, and access to bioethics. And so per protocol, every patient meets a social work. We have palliative care team that are part of our LVAD team um, that helps for high risk um, um, features. And anybody can pull that consultation, but everyone will get a social work evaluation. If there are red flags with regards to patient understanding, expectations, risk, then uh, uh, palliative care will get involved for supportive reasons. And then our bioethicist gets consulted on an as needed basis. Um, I thought you were asking if I had any ethical issues. You know, she's 71, the LVAD is on the shelf, unlike transplant in terms of a scarce resource and a limited number. I have no ethical issues using an LVAD in a 71 year old, as long as the patient has crystal clear understanding of projected benefits, risks, and we understand the patient's values and expectations. And if they align, we're all in. So excellent question. And with that, given we have 15 minutes, I'm gonna go to case three. Go ahead, sir. Thank you. Excellent. So this is a 34 year old um, female with a dilated uh, uh, genetic cardiomyopathy. She has a familial cardiomyopathy and she um, has really had progression and is not only having shortness of breath, but she's having abdominal swelling um, to the point where she's needed some paracentesis. And that that we think is a, is certainly a challenge. She, she's had progression with hypotension she had a, a history of pulmonary embolism and is on anticoagulation um, for that. And her course was complicated with a low output state requiring temporary mechanical support use. And, and I'll, I'll, I'll get back to that. So she's O positive. She's um, unfortunately very sensitized by looking at her calculated panel reactive antibodies, 86% class one. And here's her class two. So collectively, you know, a very sensitized uh, um, patient. We won't go into those specifics. Um, she had been on Entresto, didn't really tolerate higher dosages. Metoprolol tartrate was switched to uh, succinate and on low dose uh, spironolactone had some hyperkalemia. And then for her history of um, pulmonary embolism was on a Pixabam. Here's her right heart cath. And I'm going to take some time with this. So January 5th of this year, RA pressure 20, wedge 25. Not sure if you guys are following Pappy, not the baseball player, but the hemodynamic index. Here's your cardiac index 1.9 and the remainder of hemodynamics. With optimization, including the onotrope and intraortic balloon pump, we were able to get her cardiac index up north of 2.2 her filling pressure down just some, and her right atrial pressure down some, but still elevated. And her PAPI index went from 0.8 to 1.76. Looking at her end organ, uh, looking at the uh, other uh, data sets, if you will, um, you know, tachycardia, pressure holding with what we're doing with uh, onotrope and device support. And I've mentioned her hemodynamics. Um, her QRS is narrow and she's in a sinus tachycardia. Here's her plain film. We're supporting her with an impella. Uh, and this is a, an impella CP. You can see the pigtail. We sometimes do axillary surgical impellas to support patients. So let me show you her echocardiograms, if I may. And I'm going to be interested in your... In fact, what I'll do is I'll... If you guys can see my... Uh, my peristernal four chamber dedicated right view. If you guys can give me your impression of her echo. Any takers? Mm. Okay, we can, we can see um, huge left ventricle. 
um, a really poor left ventricular ejection fraction. We can see from from some um, view, like probably the right ventricle is dilated. I cannot tell you uh, like the, the the right ventricular function, but I can I can see that it's compromised too. But we can see like uh, the biventricular um, compromise. It's really huge. Yes, yes, I appreciate that. So that's perfect. So her her EF was twenty percent. She does have significant MR and significant TR, and her right ventricle is moderate to severely decreased, and I would say significantly dilated. She has no obstructive coronary disease with temporary support. Her creatinine is 1.1, liver function tests um, concerning right total bilirubin 5.3. She has marked heterogeneity on her abdominal ultrasound, ultrasound probably from chronic congestion but the remainder of her workup was largely unremarkable. I mentioned we always look at CAT scans, really nothing to look at here, and we always do the psychosocial nutrition, pharmacy, and financial. And so what would you guys do in this patient? And I'm interested, and there's you know not a lot of good answers here, and I'm gonna take another five or six minutes to share with you my thoughts on predicting RV failure. Thanks. This looks a little bit like the case we have, uh, uh, which is going to be our first case because she's very sensitized. She's a bit older and you can't do a heart transplant, but I think the, the LVAD is a, is, a, is a way to go. Any um, other comments? Yeah, I have a comment on this patient. Well, our patient has um, the right ventricular function really better, you know. She just have a mild uh, right ventricular dysfunction, so probably it's kind of different. But for this patient, it would be pretty, I mean, pretty um, important to use some clinical variables and probably some hemodynamic variables and echo variables to to I mean, to make kind of a score to predict the uh, right ventricular failure risk, because it has a lot of risk for right ventricular failure after the elbow implant. So I don't know how, I mean, which score do you use? I mean, you use just variables, hemo, I mean, clinical variables or hemodynamic variables, or which is the best um, echo variable you use to predict excellent. the right ventricular failure. Excellent, excellent question. It's like you've looked at my slides and are and are setting me up beautifully to uh, to, to comment. So, so I'm going to tell you what we've used, and I'm going to share with you a publication our group had, and and we do like among all the hemodynamic variables, PAPI the most, and that's the difference in the systolic and diastolic pulmonary artery pressure. Index to load, that's the right atrial pressure. You simply divide the, you divide, you, you, you know, you do the subtraction divided by right atrial pressure, and we know a normal PAPI is greater than one. We looked at 245 patients that did not have RV failure compared to those that did. We know, we would, we hypothesize this, and, and I'm going to get to some scoring. Those requiring vasopressors, um, certainly sicker patients, those with kidney issues, liver issues, more uh, more RV failure compared to not. And we look at the CORMOS score, which incorporates ventilatory status, BUN, and CVP to wedge. And, you know, we've known historically when you have a CVP to wedge over um, 0.67, it's a, it's a risk factor for um, needing an unplanned RVAD. And, and you know a value of 0.5, it still held up in terms of those that went on for 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 unplanned RVAD and those with an initial happy under 1.5. And this has been very consistent with what's historically been defined. Um, you know the sicker patients are by Intermax, the greater the risk for RV failure. And and you know the majority we really have less than 10% patients were taken for isolated VAD that are Intermax one. 
Intermax twos and threes account for the majority, but we have about 25 to 30% that are ambulatory Intermax four. But what's unique about this experience is it's not snapshots in time, but sequential. So we have um, patients that come in, we do a workup, we have their initial profile, echo, hemodynamic, um, and clinical scores, and we optimize onotropes, balloons, uh, impella support, and then we look at their variables. We believe that those patients that look preclusive, if their physiologic state improves, albeit with support, we think we may be able to get them to through LVAD. And so we coined this term Delta Pappy. And here's patients with an event, and those that had an improvement in their Pappy had a lower adverse event rate, blue versus red Kaplan-Meier curve. And so to answer your question, we don't hang our hat on anything in particular. It's clinical assessment. I'm going to tell you about my bias with echo. It's echo clinical and hemodynamics um, and, and change in hemodynamics. When we look at the chi-square in terms of prediction models, it's best when you're using this these variables in an incremental additive fashion. So in Houston, we did a similar experience with a very robust echo examination. And uh, the RV remodeling out of proportion to LV remodeling held up the best. Let me define that. We take the parasternal long axis LV dimension. On the four chamber, we me measure the RV base. Panel B would be an example of overt RV remodeling out of proportion to LV. Panel A is more of the typical. Those that had an RV LV cutoff that was um, greater than um, 0.75 had a worse event-free survival, including unplanned RV. And so what I'm mentioning is when you add, there's different scoring systems, Matthew score, Cornwall score I mentioned, but when you add this echo, hemo, uh, this echo parameter to these scoring systems, you get a better predict prediction, right? This is the area under the curve of 0.73 compared to 0.63 alone. So what I would encourage you all to do as you entertain this patient that's sensitized with some degree of RV dysfunction, you're gonna to wanna to look at how sick she is, her echo surrogates. My bias is the best aero surrogate is RV. This patient is a different patient, but this is more of a dedicated RV view. When you see a right atrium bigger than the left atrium, an RV equivalent to or greater than the LV size, that is a worrisome profile. Tricuspid regurg you can potentially fix. Um, RV systolic function as for an individual patient may matter, but when you look at large cohorts of data, it falls off as not make multi-variable uh, 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 independent prediction as a parameter of importance. Um, not to say that RV function doesn't matter, um, but you're gonna see a lot of patients with RV systolic function. For me, it's how's the RV remodeled when you unload the LV? Are you gonna be stuck with a potential need for VAD? So going back to where I started and with my recommendations for you and your program, yeah, if you can start off with patients that are in this Intermax 3, 4 category for VAD, you're going to offer a, you know, survival advantage. They may, may be the least risk risky to start with. I would encourage you not to start off with these crashing and burning patients. If you get those and can optimize and improve their profile, you may be able to um, get them through. Um, I've mentioned some of the risk modeling and the ambulatory patients, but I think you don't necessarily need to start with these super less sick. I and mean, you want to have equipoise as a team. Um, so our line in the sand is Intermax 4 or lower score or worse. And we use the shared decision making. And I, I think sitting down with a patient to discuss benefits or risks is key. Um, shared decision making is not just here's the informed consent in terms of risks and benefits. It's, it's eliciting patient values and preferences. There have been two decision aids that can guide your team. Larry Allen out of University of Colorado published one with a group of co uh, colleagues, and I published one with uh, ethicists and bioethicists at Baylor College of Medicine and a number of other centers. Um, um, and both these decision aids are available online and can improve knowledge gaps and can improve team dynamic in terms of understanding of whether a patient wants to proceed. And if you don't have a bad patient to meet your patient because you're just starting, they could look at these patient testimonials to understand what it means to live with the bad. And so I, I point you to this uh, lbaddecisionaid.com that we've created. 
I mentioned we're doing 100 VADs. Our 30-day survival is 97%. Our one-year survival is 96%. So we've been successful in, uh, um, in this regard. We use HeartMate 3 contemporary data to guide patients' understanding of risk, short-term, long-term stroke, and survival. We couple that with institutional data. So this case three, you know, Hector said, show me a case not to do. I'm, pre I'm encouraging you not to do case three. It would be desensitization and taking her to transplant. Now, I will admit we did a HeartMate 3 on the left and on the right. This is... Um, under the umbrella of, uh, I don't want to say investigation, it's off label, but there is a, a cohort of centers pursuing HeartMate 3 support for patients instead of the total artificial heart. Um, we at the Cleveland Clinic have been pursuing this and colleagues down in Texas as well. Um, and so I would encourage you to stay away from this type of worrisome RV failure to start off with. So to conclude for, for you guys in terms of selection decision making, I know I've mentioned a lot um, but certainly you want to do a full evaluation along the different domains. Um, you want to have the patient front and center to understand your anticipated projections, and you want to be very clear about predicting RV failure. That is the number one concern early after LVAD. Here's our team. So we, we, we have 20 heart failure board certified members in our section. We're very proud of that. But you guys asked an important point. The team's a lot larger than cardiologists. So we have uh, advanced fellows, nurse practitioners, advanced practice providers, bioethics, nutrition, pharmacy, uh, very strong pathology um, and palliative care and rehab care, in, in addition to excellent surgeons and a whole host of surgical support. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a big team to do you know, these number of interventions related to VAD and transplant. I've enjoyed talking with you guys today. We have a handful of minutes for any questions, comments related to that last case or in general. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Esther, for an excellent presentation. Do we have time for some questions? I have a, a quick one. <laughs> May I? I have Hola, a quick Juliana. one. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. When, when Dr. Uh, thanks for the presentation. I mean, it's been amazing to be with you, but I have a question. For example, when you are dealing with some uh, problems with the uh, congestive hepatopathy, what stage of hepatic dysfunction do you tolerate to decide an Elbert implant? I mean, you yeah, use so the same scores when, when, you, when we are talking about heart transplant, the same scores to, for example, uh, decide uh, that we go to a combined heart and liver transplant or do you yes. use any other score? Yes, so we will not take someone with histologically proven cirrhosis to LVAD surgery or any surgery. If they have portal hypertension and stigmata for end-stage liver disease, and borderline cirrhosis, we will not take them to isolated surgery. Patients with cirrhosis, portal hypertension, so we'll do both. We'll do biopsies and we'll check the portal pressures. Um, and if they have those, either one of those, it's a heart liver transplant. Um, and and, and we, we've been doing heart liver and heart kidney more regularly. Um, so we use the traditional criteria to define end stage uh, uh, liver disease along those lines. Now, this, this lady, she's actually done well with two heart made threes um, in terms of her liver. She didn't have cirrhosis. She had congestive hepatopathy and fibrosis. Um, her total bilirubin was of concern, but her transaminases looked better. And, and so we bit the bullet. But for you guys starting out, you want to avoid those patients with worrisome liver disease, renal disease. Thank you, doctor. Um, I got one more question from the audience. Um, the question is, in the second case, how do you make an approach to predict the kidney recovery after LBAT or heart transplantation? Yeah, that's a great question. And I, I, in that particular case, I kind of told you what we did, but we would try to prove cardiorenal syndrome. So we'd float a swan and we'd try to normalize the afterload for the kidney, drop the CVP, and we'd improve the preload for the kidney, namely improve the index. And we put a swan and we do a tailored therapy with the honotropes. If honotropes don't get us there, we put in a balloon. 
And we actually proved that the kidneys get better because it was cardiorenal syndrome. So diuresis and, uh, you know, support with contractility enhancement uh, medication wise or or by by device therapy. And and so we traditionally prove the kidneys are better with those measures. And and in the case I showed you, it was a bit unfair. I, 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 I and it was the truth, though. We, you know, we committed for destination therapy because we didn't have an alternative with transplant. The patient was more than accepting of the projections. Um, and so we brought her in. Her kidneys got a little bit better with diuresis and, and onotrope support, and we committed. Um, but that's how we do it. We try to prove it. Now, if your GFR stays under 30, despite everything you can do, that is a risk factor for needing renal replacement therapy. And I can tell you the intersection of durable VAD and needing hemodialysis, renal replacement therapy, is a poor projection in terms of long-term outcome. Um, and these patients need a lot of support with dedicated dialysis centers that understand monitoring blood pressure. The right side is going to be under stress. They're at higher risk for infection if you use short-term lines to do renal replacement therapy. So, so for you guys, if I were writing your uh, inclusion exclusion criteria, I would say um, you shouldn't. You, sh you should avoid patients with GFRs under 30. If they have renal failure, prove ren renal function gets better. 30 to 40 would be a borderline gray zone where you can have journal club and talk about it. Ideally, for your first few, a GFR above 40. Okay. Muchas gracias, Dr. Este, por acompañarnos. Gracias a todos los participantes por su asistencia. Y nuevamente, gracias a Ot por su apoyo para el desarrollo de esta conferencia. Hasta una próxima oportunidad. Muchas gracias a todos. Gracias, doctora Mónica, doctor Santa Cruz, y nuevamente, doctor Este, por acompañarnos. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you much. Gracias, mi amigos. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. Hasta Bye. luego.